one and only Bonnie Badenoch. <laughs> Bonnie, um, Bonnie has been in in the field for a while. She uh, she's a she is a resource for us. She's been a therapist, mentor, teacher, author. 17 years um, integrating the discoveries of relational neuroscience into the art of therapy. In 2008, she co-founded the nonprofit agency Nurturing the Heart with the Brain in Mind. Many of you may be familiar with many of Bonnie's books, Being a Brainwise Therapist. That's how I first um, came across <laughs> you, Bonnie, was that book landed in my hands. Um, then going on and creating the Brain Savvy Therapist Workbook. And then my favorite book that you have created, The Heart of Trauma, Healing the Embodied Brain in the Context of, um, of Relationships. Bonnie does so much, uh, but I want to highlight that for the last 30 years, she has supported trauma survivors and those with significant attachment wounds to reshape their neural landscapes for a life of meaning, so beautiful, resilience and warm relationships. Her conviction that wisdom about the relational brain can support healing experiences for people at every age led to the publications of all of these different books and everything that you are up to in the world. Okay. Um, Bonnie, thank you so much for being on this podcast with me. Well, thank you for inviting me, Lisa. I yes. value your work also very deeply. Well, I think I really think our field is significantly challenged in the way that we train therapists. Mm -hmm. But I had the experience of someone who could be with me in the depths of my terror and in the, the depths of all of that and not, not turn away, not try to steer me away, but be present with me and allow the healing to unfold naturally. And I think that um, I think that's why this topic for our conversation just feels so um, I'm going to use the word like poignant for, for what's happening in our times, because you've, you've really been able to see the, the field over many years and see where, where we've come, where we hung out for a bit, where we've arrived. And I've heard you say over the last many years, you've spoken to how we've, we've really swung, really left, uh, mm -hmm. left brain. And can, can we go into that conversation a little bit about what you've observed and then we can make our way back to right brain and, and this non-judgmental presence? Yeah, I, I, I know I, I, when I was in my uh, getting my master's in as a marriage and family therapist, there was still more space, it seemed, for kind of a depth approach and one that rested on this kind of profound connection, you know, Carl Rogers wasn't so far away that we'd forgotten him, which we seem to have a, a lot now. <clears throat> but over the years, as we got, as I think the whole world and our culture, our Western cultures anyway, have gotten more and more concretized into the left hemisphere, there has been this movement toward what are the protocols, what are the interventions, and a more what we call evidence-based therapy, <clears throat> and and, uh, and cognitive behavioral ways of, of dealing with people and helping people. And all of that has pulled us away from depth and pulled us as clinicians into the role of being the expert that knows how to fix people. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned through interpersonal neurobiology, as well as my own experience, but really foundational, is that the wisdom of healing is in the client. It's not in us. Mm -hmm. And when we try to come in as the expert and try to, you know, imagine like, we see people through the lens of diagnosis, which puts everybody in a box. It's like, oh, you have anxiety. You go in this box and I should do these things in order to help your anxiety be relieved. When we begin to do that, the individuality of the person gets washed away. And the sense of us being kind of in this together in a way that I can support you and you can show me what it is you need. Nobody is just an anxiety disorder. We don't treat disorders, really. We treat humans. And humans are so variable. My person might come in anxious this week, kind of depressed the next week, feeling really good the following week. And they're going to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so I want to follow them there. And I want to be with them where they are so that their, their wisdom can begin to show through. And our field is way far away from that. Not everybody, obviously. There are people that are really working to be, to cultivate their own inner world, to provide safety and give people room to heal. But that isn't most of the training. And uh, 
some of the newest models that I've seen. I can't even remember what the name of it is, but it was really frightening where you practice the same protocol over and over and over again until you can do it flawlessly. Oh gosh. Wow. It really scared me to read about that. It's like that that's not how we allow people the room to to be able to grow and develop and and also have these deeply human relationships. Yeah. It's so relieving to let go of being the expert, especially when we can't really do it. Well, and even that piece that you were just saying that it takes away the individual and it um you know, if we're if we're trying to practice getting something right or we're following that protocol, people are so complex and they're so nuanced that the person in front of us, I don't know, this is my experience, disappears. And and it's it, and I'm not I'm not working with a person, I'm working with an agenda. Yes. Which is so which yeah. is so different. Yeah, totally different. If we come in with with an agenda instead of following and listening to what our people have to say, it doesn't mean we don't know how to offer things. That might be EMDR. It might be uh, somatic experiencing. I we do a lot of sand tray and with our group and art and things like that. But also this kind of deeper internal work. It doesn't mean we don't know about those things and don't want to hold a space for them. But when I offer them, I want to say to the person. So I'm wondering. It seems like you're kind of looking at the sand tray shelves. Are you feeling drawn that way mm -hmm. and then they can say yes or no to me it's like no this thing just caught my eye or yeah i really want to go there so it's always this kind of dance where i will offer something tentatively and then ask how is that for you does that feel right for you you know and then we go from there and so we're we're constantly doing this following and responding dance which looks a lot like attachment work right i mean that's what we do with our babies we hope <laughs> as very best we can and and we do it really well sometimes and not well other times we come back and repair and so it's this human dance brought into the counseling room that i think is is really what we all yearn for really yearn to be met and heard and have I've been respected and valued for the wisdom that lives in us. Yeah. So where does non-judgmental presence, how do you, how do you think about that in the context of what you just shared? Well, yeah, I think again, boy, this really coming to Steve, Stephen Porges's work, polyvagal theory has been such a revelation. And I think I kind of got a rough idea of it you know, many years ago. And then every time I go back and be with it, it gets more and more subtle and more and more um, informs how it is that we are invited to be together. So basically what polyvagal theory says to us is that what we're all yearning for is connection. Steve says connection is a biological imperative and connection happens in places where we feel safe. So safety is actually a state, the neuroception, which means our whole system underground outside our conscious awareness. If we have a neuroception of safety, our whole neurobiology orients itself to opening to receive people. Mm -hmm. We go into what's called the social engagement system. And you hear words like window of tolerance, but we, a bunch of people around me have started saying window of receptivity, which feels much more welcoming than the word tolerance. We don't just tolerate people, we receive them. Or another friend calls it window of welcome, you know? And that happens when we have a neuroception of safety. So when I'm in that state, then I am not in judgment because, to, yeah, because when we go into that state, we're in the right hemisphere and the right hemisphere is not a judging place, it's a relating place. The left does the judging, and we need to do that sometimes. And the right does the opening and the receiving. So this ventral aspect, the social engagement system, lateralizes to the right hemisphere, where we open to others and welcome them. And then they begin to resonate with that and begin to settle into enough safety to become vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So the, the hallmark of this kind of receptivity is non-judgmental presence without agenda. Like, I'm really interested in where you are and what's happening for you right now. And I don't need to put anything of mine within my human limits on that. I mean, nobody does any of this perfectly. We should say that from the very outset. But when we move in that direction and kind of open our heart and our, our minds with this warm curiosity of what, what I will say often when people come in, what comes with you today? You know, so that we can settle in and they can spend some time kind of going, well, this, I think, is, you know, what's most present here for me right now. 
And then I'm following that. So I, but without any judgments, you know, a person could come in and say, I'm hating you today. And be like, wow, tell me some more about that. What's going on with that? So, and they wouldn't say it in that tone of voice, of course. But <laughs> I've had more than one person come in and say, I'm so angry at you. I don't know what to do. And it's all your fault. <laughs> You know, so if that comes in, I think again, by being grounded in in the in the neuroscience, I don't have to take that so personally, but really I can take it with interest and wonder what is happening right now. And I'm very happy to acknowledge if I've done something, you know, really dumb, like didn't return a call or said something really thoughtless. I, I'm very glad people can share that with me. But I really want to be with what's happening in that moment. And when that happens and they feel like every part of them the angry parts the sad parts the joyous parts are welcome something magical happens in the room that gives them access to their inner wisdom that allows them to move toward healing as we as we dance together in this yeah. but it's yeah. that lack of judgment and of course the minute you are doing diagnosis assessment and all of that it's just filled with judgments and it puts people off because it, we're in sympathetic arousal at that point, trying to control something, and they feel it in their bodies, and then they pull back. I've had so many people say, this is the first time I felt like I could ever be honest with a therapist. I have a, um, a question that's emerging, that, and I realize this question is, is asking you to bring some um, left brain um, language to uh not such a left um or a right brain mm -hmm. process for someone that ha spends a lot of time less left hemisphere who may not really even have a sense of well, what does it feel like to be in this place of and hold non-judgmental presence because they're so used to looking at through things through the lens of diagnosis or label if so if i were to ask you what does it feel like as a clinician, what does it feel like to be in non-judgmental presence with our client? Yeah, I think it's a great question because we've all had experiences like this that we can draw on. I don't think there's probably anybody alive that hasn't had moments where they felt deeply listened to, whether it was by a teacher, if it couldn't happen in the family or a friend or something. And to feel in our bodies what happens when we feel really received. So what I notice is, is that my muscles relax, my belly gets soft, my heart kind of expands and maybe feels warm. My throat feels really tender and gentle, like doesn't there's not a lot of tension there. And one of the things I really notice is that my everything softens around my eyes and I become kind of aware. Um, I can't remember the man's name, but he talks about being aware of, the, of what's in the center of our attention, but also the background at the same time, mm -hmm. where you're kind of taking in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then what wells up in me if somebody gives me a space like that is this intense sense of gratitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If someone can receive me like that, I, my whole being feels so grateful that someone can give me that space. So that's me resonating with their safety. But the safety I'm offering comes from my body. And we, we know when we're in this social engagement system, our voice quality changes, the quality of our listening changes. All of these things are, can be then offered to the other person whose system is geared to resonate with us and to feel the effect of how they're being seen. Whereas if I'm trying to think of what protocol should I do next and how should I do that, my eyes will tighten up, my voice will change, my body will be tense, and that will also communicate to the other person that it's not really safe here. What Bonnie Badenock says, this is it in a nutshell. Any other approach in trauma therapy, it just doesn't work. And in particular, when you are autistic, then you for sure do not want to be treated as a diagnosis, but all the more as a human being. And some psychotherapists have really a very weird idea how to meet you when they know you are autistic. 
and then connection goes out the window. My somatic experiencing therapists I used to work with said connecting from one nervous system to the other. That's completely non judgmental. You can feel it in your body because there is instant relax. It just happens. You don't think of making it happen. It just happens. And I know very well when I'm in a state of fight flight, feeling stressed. It's completely different from feeling accepted, feeling welcomed. Your nervous system just reacts immediately as you feel safe. There is no danger. And it's beautiful to have that connection with any human being. So where I find connection is in nature. In nature, I can just be because nature just is. There is no judgment, no left hemisphere perception. And therefore, nature puts you in a state of right hemisphere heart connection. You relax exactly the way as Bonnie Badenoch has described it. Because you are in harmony with. That's a beautiful state to be in.